Yo, 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 what it do, what it be, it's your boy, Agent A-N-T, repping the spell block, Agent C, coming to you with a Mafia 2 commentary, and yes, it's season 2, episode 2 of Kingpins and Capo, so let's get right into it. This is the origins of the Gambino crime family today, and we discussed the Genovese's in the last video, so let's get, let's get it, y'all. The origins of the Gambino crime family can be traced back to Ignacio Lupo, who I talked about in my previous video, and uh, he opened up a grocery store on 39th Street between 9th and 10th Avenue or sometime around 1902. Uh, this is Again, sometime, this is around the time that Giuseppe Morello was opening up his saloon. And uh, if you didn't watch my last video, Ignacio Lupo... Uh, he was actually the boss of uh, Little Italy in New York at the time, uh, and Giuseppe Morello, he actually had uh, mob ties back from the old country back in Sicily, uh, so he kind of knew, he actually brought the, the black hand extortion methods kind of over to New York and kind of expanded and, and innovated on them because he, the Morello family... Uh, as I said, last video was one of the first families to use the method of uh, actually using their protection money and making stores pay protection money and then using that money to fund their legal uh, business ventures and, and kind of launder their illegal money through that. So they, you know, and you see everybody doing it now, any successful business, you know, that's kind of how they started. But anyways, uh, so... Around 1902, Ignacio Lupo opens up that store. He was already he's the boss, became the boss of Little Italy in 1903. He marries Giuseppe Morello's sister, and you know pretty much the Morello fam, the Morello crime family is born with an alliance between you know the Lupo family and all that. So, uh, Ignacio Lupo, Giuseppe Morello, and another guy by the name of Tommaso the Ox Pedo, they. Uh, besides being savvy businessmen and, and, you know, running rackets and all that, they ruled with, you know, absolute iron fists. They was about the violence, you know, they are, they are calling card, as I mentioned last video again. Uh, they would cut up dudes' bodies and just leave them in barrels around New York City, right? Like, just to kind of send a message like, you know, don't fuck with the Black Hand or, or the Morello family or none of that. So, uh... As I had mentioned previously, again, uh, the Gambino and the Genovese's, they, they share similar roots in their crime family trees, but I'll get to how they branched off. You know, see what I did there, tree branch off? He, anyway, y'all. So, Salvatore D'Aquila uh, in the 1920s and, and Joe Masseria, both of those guys in the 20s wanted to be boss of all bosses. Keep in mind... Uh, Lupo and Morello got sent upstate for federal uh, counterfeiting charges. Not only were they racketeering, they were also counterfeiting, you know, money and, you know, other things that they could. So, they went to federal <laughs> federal prison for counterfeiting. And this is back in the early 1900s, so that just goes to show how deep they were. They actually, uh, Ignacio Lupo actually had, like, a whole counterfeiting operation going on in, like, the Sicilian Mountains or some shit like that. So... Uh, they got sent upstate. Salvatore, Salvatore D'Aquila, who was uh, actually a good friend of Morello's, and Joe Masseria, who was just a young, he was an up-and-coming uh, mobster with ties to the old country, similar to Morello. But with Salvatore D'Aquila and Joe Masseria wanting to be boss of all bosses after Morello and Lupo kind of went upstate, the power struggle between the two families kind of went on. And Joe Masseria came out the winner. Salvatore de Aquila and his bodyguard were killed. And with that, Joe Masseria became boss of all bosses and forced the, the boss of what would become the Bonanno family uh, to step down. This was Nicola Shiro. Uh, after Nicola Shiro warned a rival San Francisco mob boss that, Masir that Masseria was going to kidnap him, he fell out of graces with Masseria. And Masseria pretty much forced him out. And so after that, Salvatore Maranzano took his place, and he pretty much said, this fucking Masseria guy, what, he thinks he could treat my family like that? Who the fuck is this guy anyway? Oh, he's a fucking bum. So, the Castello Marisi war began, and Maranzano and his crew uh, 
they they got the dub. You know, they they killed Joe Masseria, and you know, around this whole Castella Marisi war, a lot of the older guys who helped build up and brought a lot of innovations to the mafia, like Giuseppe Morello, they were actually whacked. They was killed and by by younger dudes uh, up and coming and wanting to kind of fit the mafia and mold the mafia into how they saw it and how they thought it should be. So uh, a, a group of young Italians, which included Lucky Luciano, Tommy Lucchese, Joe Adonis, Frank Costello, Bugsy Siegel, and Albert Anastasia uh, had ideas that if the mob worked with, you know, the Jewish mafia and, and the other, the other uh, gangs in New York City or crime organizations, that they could increase their profits instead of going to war and going to jail and, and causing unnecessarily blood, unnecessary bloodshed in the streets and all that. They figured that they could, uh, you know, like I said, ma you know, make a, a good thing out of this, you know, increase their profits and make some allies along the way instead of just constantly being at war with each other and the other gangs for territory and stuff like that. So the Young Turks actually had a, uh, not really a plan, but... Asmar and Zana revealed his true colors and they saw that he wasn't really as good of a leader as they thought. The Young Turks uh, pretty much had decided that Maranzano had to go. So uh, they planned to get rid of Maranzano. They pretty much pulled up on him. <laughs> uh, while Lucky, Lucky Luciano was playing a card game with him, the A-team pulled up. Joe Adonis, uh, Bugsy Siegel... Uh, Albert Anastasia, they the, those three guys for sure are rumored to have pulled up and, and whacked Maranzano while he was at this card game. So, uh, after Maranzano was gone, they actually established the commission, uh, which was comprised of the five crime families of New York and, you know, a couple of other successful families and organizations like the, the Buffalo crime family and other stuff like that. But, um, as I've said before, Maranzano actually started the concept of the five families, uh, but and the, the modern mafia power structure of each family, like the boss consigliere soldier affiliate roles and all that. Uh, but, uh, the Turks and, Lu and Luciano took those concepts and, and, and kind of expanded upon them. Like I said, they made it, they, Luciano got rid of the boss of all bosses, uh, uh, title and pretty much made it a, a governing body, if you will, uh, like a democratic kind of thing instead of just having one guy use the, the other families as a hedge fund. So... Uh, after Luciano and the Turks set up Maranzano and established a new era, the era of the mob, where instead of you know warring with each other and, and doing you know these big outlandish crimes, they relied more on bribery and, and using their their ties and actually infiltrating you know like unions and stuff like that in order to uh, gain their power and stuff. So. Uh, Vincent Mangano took over what is now known as the Gambino crime family. And in 1931, during the meeting where Luciano established the, the new bosses or, or kept the bosses of the five families and pretty much let them know, hey, there's no more boss of all bosses and this is how we're going to run things from now on. I couldn't find a lot of info on Vincent Mangano other than the fact that he was more of a more of a businessman than a ruthless gangster and as he was he was interested more in controlling labor unions and money making rackets than committing you know these outlandish acts of murder that gets you know the headlines and all that but him and Albert Anastasia didn't see eye to eye in fact they fucking hated each other and if y'all y'all know about Albert Anastasia they eventually he would be called the what is it, the Lord High Executioner of the mob? Like, this dude was about the violence. <laughs> and so he was, he, that's probably where they didn't see eye to eye, because Anastasia is in there telling him, like, yo, you got to take this guy out. And Mangano is like, hey, kid, like, you know, why you want to kill everybody? He's a fucking, he's a fucking psychopath. But uh, <clears throat> eventually, this beef, you know, brewed over. And Mangano, he, he ended up missing. His body was never found. 
and his brother his brother ended up dead his brother woke up dead how you wake up dead i don't know but he ended up dead so uh yeah as after mangano disappeared lo and behold albert anastasia took his spot now again th this current family the gambinos they really don't believe in that whole like if, if you kill a made man you don't like if you kill a made man in the gambino family you probably gonna be the next boss and, and here's you, you'll see what i mean by that let me let me let me keep spitting so uh after mangano disappeared like i said anastasia took over took over his boss and it, as i discussed previously thomas dewey got someone from murder inc which albert anastasia was the leader of you know that's probably like i said that's probably why him and mangano didn't get along he's literally the head of murder inc and mangano don't want to kill nobody he's like bro you got a, t a hit squad on your back and you want to use this shit bro well, nah fuck that i'm gonna be the leader then so uh thomas dewey who was on just a path of just getting all these mobsters out of the way he actually got this guy abe Rellies, aka kid twist to rat on anastasia but he didn't even make it to trial because he got killed he got thrown from a three-story building and that that brought even more heat down on anastasia so anastasia was making enemies in, in law enforcement the biggest enemy in law enforcement at the time and then he was also making powerful enemies in the jewish mob as well because he opened up some casinos in cuba uh to compete with meyer lansky who was actually very close with lucky luciano and lepke buckhalter who they were actually a part of murder inc as well i think lepke buckhalter took over uh as leader after anastasia you know got his spot but uh He's making big big name enemies in the underworld. He's making big name enemies in law enforcement. That combined with Je uh, Vito Genovese coming back from uh, being extradited to Italy and all that. He got his legal issues taken away. Or his legal issues taken care of, I should say. And he was he started making his move to be boss uh, with of his own crime family. And, you know, eventually he did the Genovese and all that. But... He made a secret deal, Vito Genovese did with, uh, he made a deal with Carlo Gambino, like, hey, you help me be boss, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll help you t be boss, you feel me? So on October 1957, Albert Anastasia was killed while getting his hair cut, and with Anastasia gone, uh, Gambino took over, as, and just as Genovese had promised, and two years later on 1959, Genovese would be sentenced to 15 years on drug trafficking charges. Now, that was after the whole Appalachian meeting got discovered, and the drug trafficking charges were actually kind of set up by the commission because Genovese, he thought, you know, the Appalachian meeting, he was going to say, hey, I'm the boss of all bosses, or, you know, I'm, I'm running shit now in a sense. But it backfired on him because the police found out about the meeting place, and uh, I mean, he brought, like I said, a lot of unnecessary attention on the mob, and he had to go. Now, instead of killing Genovese, they were just like, nah, he just, you know, he gets jail time. He didn't, you know, break any major rules. He's, he's just he's just a little misguided. But, uh, so, with, uh, with Genovese gone and Luciano getting deported, you know, like 10 years before that, the Gambino family was actually in better shape than a lot of the other families. And there was no definite leader or boss of all bosses of the commission at this time. So they kind of had the controlling share in the commission because uh, the Gambinos were really, they were good friends, uh, close allies with uh, Tommy Lucchese and Stefano Magarino, who, if you all don't know, that was the leader of the Buffalo crime families or the Buffalo Mafia. So in, in 1963... Uh, Joe Bonanno began plotting to kill the, these guys, Gambino, Lucchese, and Stefano Magarino. And he, in doing so, his plan was to control all five families, not really be like boss of all bosses, but he wanted the controlling stake. And this was this whole thing was brought on because they didn't give him a spot in the commission. You know, when he took over his boss, you know, they said, oh, you haven't really done enough to earn a seat on the commission so you got to kind of do more and you know what more could he do other than kill him so you know it's kind of like when a he wanted a seat on the on the supervillain table you feel me like 
you want to be on a seat with you know the Legion of Doom and all that, and they told you no, so now you just like, oh, now I gotta kill the Legion of Doom. You, <laughs> you know, it's crazy, crazy, right? Because he's like he's a super villain, and you're trying to kill some of the biggest super villains in the city. So, uh, <laughs> so he sent a young a young guy by the name of Jos Joe Colombo Joseph Colombo to to kill Carlo Gambino. And, uh, instead of doing that, uh, but, uh, Colombo went straight to Gambino and said, hey, this Bonanno guy, he's, he's trying to take you out. And so, Bonanno found out somehow that the commission knew that he was trying to kill him, and he went into hiding. You know, smart guy, you feel me? He knew, he knew what they was going to do. And, uh, since, uh, Colombo pretty much turned against his boss and all that, the commission... You know, because the Gambinos and those three guys I just mentioned, they had the controlling stake. They rewarded uh, Colombo uh, with his own family. They gave him the Perfacci family, which is now, uh, excuse me, now even known today as the Colombo family. Uh, so the and just not even two years later, this is how crazy the mob is. Two years later, after they named Colombo the head of the family, they may uh, have may or may not have had a hand in shooting Colombo. Uh, granted, it could have been Joey Gallo, and I'll get to that in the Colombo video. But yeah, uh, after uh, Colombo took on the uh, the role of you know family, uh, the boss of the family, he took on a more public role and started getting out in the open with the you know this Italian rights league or something like that. And uh, the mafia really didn't like the attention he was drawing to himself, so. Maybe he had to go, but then again, Joe Gallo, we'll, we'll get to that in another video, like I said, but, uh, so after, you know, Colombo got, got shot or whatever, uh, Carlo Gambino died of natural causes in 1976, and Paul Castellano was his longtime underboss. He was named to be his successor the whole time. Oh my God! Y'all see me just knock dude out. I r walked up on him, ran his pockets, and smacked him with his own blick. Y'all see that? Oh my God, bro! I'm crazy. But anyways, uh, uh, yeah. So when uh, Castellano, when Castellano took over after Gambino's death, one of Castellano's main enemies was actually within his own family. It was a middle-aged gangster. He was involved in a lot of high-profile murders and heists. This guy's name was John Gotti. Now, John Gotti, of course, deserves a whole video that I'll get to in the future. But he and Castellano, like uh, Anastasia and Mangano before them, fucking hated each other's guts. And you know what that means. That means one of them gotta go. So, that ended up being Castellano. Castellano ended up, you know, disappearing as well. And, uh, we've all seen the movies, you know, y'all are probably thinking, well, I thought in the Mafia, you couldn't kill a made man without, you know, sanctioning from the commission or permission from the commission. It's the whole Biggie line, shout out Biggie, but, um, so he took out his own crime boss and then right after, or John Gotti takes out Castellano and then they name John Gotti, Sammy Gravano, and Frank DeChico, bosses of the uh, Gambino family. And it didn't really make a lot of sense to some. They saw it as, like, you know, breaking the fucking rules. So for this, uh, DeChico was killed by the Lucchese family in retaliation for Castellano. Uh, and that left Gotti and Gravano as bosses. Uh, and, ac and actually, Frank DeChico's murder was actually supposed... It was an, assassin uh, an assassination attempt on Gotti, but they got... Uh, the Chico instead. So, uh, pretty much after, like I said, after the Chico's death, uh, Gotti became the face and the brains. Pause. Uh, but and then Gravano was the muscle. And under Gotti, the Gambinos continued being the most successful family, but with a catch. Now, John Gotti was a very flamboyant. And, and he was well liked, sure, and, but he liked displaying who he was. And this was the exact opposite of reclusive uh, and, and secretive as the organization that he was a part of strived to be. And 
ultimately the Teflon Don's right hand man Sammy Gravano would be the one to testify against him and and, and again I mean everybody talks Sammy Gravano one of the most famous rats ever in the mafia but I mean Gr uh John Gotti was literally going to do the exact same thing and doesn't really get as much hate, which is something I really don't understand. Gravano knew that uh, John Gotti was going to try and pin all of these murders and shit on him, so he was like, no, fuck that. Like, I'm not going to let that slide. I'm going to rat before my own guy can rat on me. Like, so, and, and this was the 90s. This is not the 60s and then like that. So you see Gravano now. He doing YouTube videos and stuff like that. If this was like the 50s, 40s, bro, Gravano would be in the ground right now. And so that just goes to show kind of how after John Gotti got taken down, you know, the mafia, before they were outlandish, they were going to clubs, John Gotti would have, you know, six, six to ten bodyguards waiting outside the club just to show motherfuckers like, yeah, the mafia is here, folk. But that's not what the mafia is about. It's about being a secret, a secretive organization. Yeah, sure, everybody knows what you do, but you know you can't prove nothing in court. You motherfucker Gotti rolling around with like hella evidence on him. You feel me? Like he's making himself a target for law enforcement. So, uh, like I said, after John Gotti got hemmed up and his man's ratted on him. The term Omerta and, and the Mafia in general, everything it stood for lost a lot of its power uh, in, in, in its popularity as a whole. I mean, sure, even today people are obsessed with the old time Mafia. That's because, like I said, from, let's say before the, even before even the, uh, the five families were formed, during Prohibition, the American, or the Italian-American Mafia was making guap they ran shit in a sense you know because that's even when the chicago outfit in the 20s was probably the most successful crime organization in america so from the 20s all the way up to like what the 50s maybe even the 60s before you seen you know the cartels start to move in and the bloods and the crypts start to get formed and all these other street gangs uh get formed the mafia was didn't have no comp they didn't have to split their territory now it's kind of different you know they got to kind of play ball with all these other organizations that have done the same thing that they did except you know almost you know way more bigger or vicious or vicious or more vicious it's not a word but anyways uh uh yeah so times have definitely changed like i said at gravano you see michael gravano and guys like michael franzisi doing these youtube videos which i am appreciative of because they're giving us a, a literally a look at what the life was like from a made man's eyes and they're they're telling us their experiences but again if this was back in the 60s 70s shit even any time before then bruh yeah they would not be they would be they would be where uh, jimmy hoffa and albert anastasia at in the fucking ground so um yeah, the, the, like I said, the the term Omerta in in the American Mafia as a whole has lost a lot of of power and influence. I mean, they still exist today. They're doing the same things like murder and extortion. But like I said, after Gotti, the Mafia has really resorted back to being its its reclusive, it's a secretive, reclusive organization. They stopped really heavily recruiting and bringing in outsiders. Um, it's more like, you know, like it, like it was before, based on family. Shout out Dom Toretto. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much the rise and the fall of the uh, Gambino family. I mean, they had a really good fucking run. For, from, from Carlo Gambino in the 50s and 60s all the way up till... Uh, till, like, the 90s when Gotti got, got bumped off or got, got sent upstate. So... I mean, Gambinos, I mean, they're still doing it big. They're just not doing it as big as they used to. I'm sure they're trying to make a comeback, though. But, I mean, with everybody ratting on each other and all that, I mean, it's it's doubtful. It's going to take a while. But hope you all enjoyed the video. It's been your boy, Agent A and T, Reverend the Spellblock Agency. If you like, leave a like. Subscribe. I got more hot content dropping soon. I got, uh, you know, two, three more episodes of this left. So stay tuned. Don't get smoked. It's been your boy. I'm out. Peace.